Um, further to the conversation that I seem to be having with Darth Barracuda, I asked a question. Um, what's a better motivator? Um, guilt or love? He said that we don't really need love to show compassion to other beings, and I'm not sure that I agree with that, because he may be using the word compassion where I would use the word guilt. Compassion, in my opinion, um, is a emotion that involves love. Now, we can argue that point. Um, I don't know if it's a resolvable point at all. You know, definitions of words are just matters of dispute, and how you want to use the word is not necessarily how the word is supposed to be used, according to the dictionary. Um, so we're going to have to argue what compassion is. I would say compassion has a definite element of love. Um, but let's say that we're not going to say that. Let's say that what do we mean then by compassion if we remove the love portion from it? What is compassion? I would say what you've got left then if you remove the compassion component from love is guilt and you've got a negative motivator. Uh, compassion then becomes a negative motivator if you remove the love component from it. It's a lash. It's not a carrot. It's a stick, not a carrot, rather. So, <clears throat> what I would say then is uh, compassion, the way you're using it, Darth, seems to be some sort of transition zone between uh, love and guilt. Um, we'll have to discuss that, I suppose, further if we want to examine that. But I think that the choice between uh, is apparently between love and guilt. Um, a motivator to do the right thing or to refrain from doing the wrong thing can be positive or it can be negative. It can be a carrot or it can be a stick. Guilt is the stick. Love is the carrot. And they often run counter to each other. For example, let's say that I decide that I'm going to follow Nietzsche's um, example because he's not putting this as a prescriptive. I'm, just, I'm going to quote one of his more famous quotes. You've got to note how he's actually phrasing it. He's not saying you should do this. He says, I want to be this way. First person, strictly speaking. Um, from the gay science. I want to learn more and more to see as beautiful what is necessary in things. Then I shall be one of those who make things beautiful. There's a transvaluation, right? Transvaluation of all values. Amor fati. Let, let that be my love henceforth. Love of fate. Love of that which is necessary. I do not want to wage war against what is ugly. I do not want to accuse. I do not even want to accuse those who accuse. Looking away shall be my only negation. And all in all, and on, on and on the whole, someday I wish to be only a yes-sayer. Now, what do you make of that? Uh, I would call that he wants to love everything that is n in his field of vision. Um, and you got to be careful with what you mean by love. Again, I'm, I'm reminded of um, a conversation that it's an apocryphal com conversation that allegedly took place between um, Siddhartha the hero of the eponymous novel by Hermann Hesse and Gautama, the actual Buddha, where, or sorry, no, I think it's Siddhartha and his friend Govinda, where Govinda has become a Buddhist and Buddhism says you must not love this world because this world is transitory and it will disappoint you every time that you love it. And um, Siddhartha says, wait a minute, you're, I think that we're getting tangled here in what you mean by love. I think that the Gautama, the, 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 the Buddha rather, said we mustn't love things in a grasping, sort of attached kind of way. Whereas you can sort of say, I love everything unreservedly in a, in a completely non-attached way and not be attached to them at all. And that's what Siddhartha was saying to Govinda. He said, you, you, yes, the Buddha is right when he says don't love things, but it depends on how you, like in what sense you're going to love things love the world especially. Um, and again, this is kind of the argument that I always get in, into in at least talking about Eastern philosophies between the um, affirmers and the negators. Again, if we want to use terms like that, Buddhists and Jains are 
and most Hindus are generally seen as negators, whereas the tantrics are seen as affirmers. Now again, there's so much transition ground between the two that everybody seems to occupy some portion of the middle ground. That's what I'm talking about here is axioms. In not loving the world, you're saying that you don't have a motivation to do the good. Um, but other people will say, in not loving the world, you're refusing to love the Auschwitzes of this world. You're refusing to love um, all the horrors of this world, the Hiroshima's of this world, and everything. So, guilt actually is a restraint to love, if you ask me. Um, because, you know, if you say, I love the fate that I have, and looking away shall be my only negation, um, it you're basically saying, like, conventional sort of pop psychology or pop philosophy says that for evil to triumph all you need is for good men to do nothing. Well I don't believe A that there are good men and I don't believe that there there are evil there is evil out there. Um, and I don't and, and I do see that that maxim, good men to do nothing, is the only thing that's necessary for evil to triumph, is a, got a nasty sting in its tail. Nasty sting of guilt. Um because if you do nothing, you're not a good person, therefore you're in cahoots with Satan. No, thank you. Um, if there's one thing that you say is not lovable and must be hated, then I think that you've sort of opted for a negative view of things, a negative motivator for all ethical behavior. Um, love, I think... Uh, you can actually build an ethical system without love, yes, but you can't do it without guilt, can you? At least in terms of a value-based ethical system as opposed to pure social contract. Um, a guilt or a love-based ethical system, which one do you want? Does it really matter which one we choose? from a consequentialist point of view, I would say that it does. Because even from a consequentialist point of view, um, there's more to um, the exchange. Um, there's more to the consequences than simply the consequence of harm containment. Let's say that I, I'm about to do something unethical, but I am restrained by guilt from doing it. Neither of us have benefited. There's no actual benefit from me not doing something bad. Um, whereas, if I choose to refrain from doing something unethical, out of love, I would say I benefit, e even though the other person doesn't benefit. They simply don't have a harm done to them. Whereas, when I love, I am benefited. Whereas, if I feel guilt, I am harmed. I am placed in a deficit. I am the one who is in the driver's seat, in the first-person view of what I'm doing. When I choose to do something, or when I choose to refrain from doing something out of guilt, I have actually been harmed. I have felt that lash. If I refrain from doing something out of love, I've got a little injection of love into my system, which actually is a positive for me. Um, and again, you think about what that actually involves in actual love. You've got to learn to love the unlovable if you want to look at the world that way. That's a big if, though. Again, this is not a prescriptive. It's not saying that this is what you should do. Again, read what Nietzsche says. I want to learn more and more. I do not want. I do not even want. He's simply talking about his own experience. He's referring to the experiential inherent in all ethical thinking not just the outcome for the potential victim, but the outcome for the potential perpetrator, I suppose we could call it. The outcome for the perpetrator. Why would the perpetrator choose guilt versus love as a motivator not to do the wrong thing? Uh, because love feels good and guilt does not. And love actually strengthens you. Guilt doesn't. Guilt weakens you. Um, you know, and again, you, you end up in that situation where you have to learn to love what is horrible. Yes, you do. That's if you want to feel this way, if you want to be strengthened. That's why the, the sort of the way that I approach love is a way that most people sort of recoil from. 
You've got to paint the ugliest picture imaginable and then learn to love it. Not because it's the right thing to do. Do you really want to feel love? Do you really want to feel the benefits and the transformative power of love? Do you really want to feel that? If you do, then here's the way to do it, per Nietzsche. A lot of people are sort of shocked, I think, at this view of Nietzsche, but I think that it's, it, it's unavoidable. When you read that passage from the gay science, Nietzsche has a prophet of love. That's crazy. The guy's nothing but a sneering, arrogant jerk. Yeah. Aren't we all? But we all have the capacity, and I would say the need or the desire for love. Which one do you want? Take your pick. Do you want to do things as a result of the existence of a lash? Or do you want to do things um, as a result of the uh, existence of a positive benefit. It's really all up to us, isn't it, as individuals. We're each alone with this decision or with this view of things, because that's really ultimately all it is. It's a perspective.